Hello and welcome to the Hall of Fame Fatherhood Podcast. I am your host, Steve Mistovich. First of all, I just want to take a second. If you are new to this podcast and you have looked through the catalog that I have posted so far, which is only six episodes, you'll see a gap of about almost two months, month and a half or so. And uh, that is a self-imposed hiatus to recording, and I'm back making a commitment to weekly recordings and putting those out, and uh, just wanted to put that out there that, hey, even... When there's breaks, whether self-imposed or not, uh, you fall off the wagon, you get back on, and you keep you get back to work. And uh, so, I just wanted to share that. I just wanted to help keep myself accountable, throwing it out to the world, and uh, you can take that for what it's worth. In this episode, I want to breach the topic of death. Uh, This past week with the tragedy at the Uvalde school, school shooting. It's, you know, at the forefront of everybody's mind and I'm not going to focus, nor do I think it's appropriate to focus on the laws and all the the media outlets, uh, topics that they want us to pay attention to. Uh, Like what we do here at Hall of Fame Fatherhood is we focus on fathers and families and what we can do inside the walls of our homes. Uh, And breaching the topic of death with our children is, is one of those responsibilities that we hold. And there's numerous ways to go about it, obviously. Uh... And for this, I just want to offer up one possible solution. Uh, And what I want to do is I was lucky enough to have a couple conversations with a man named Stephen Jenkinson. Now, if you've never heard of him, Stephen was a hospice worker. Uh, He was the subject of a feature-length documentary film called Grief Walker, uh, which I highly recommend. It was very good. Uh, his book, he's written several books, three I'll mention. Uh, Die Wise, A Manifesto for Soul and Sanity. Uh, a Generation's Worth, uh, Spirit Work While the Crisis Reigns, which actually just came out in 2021. And Come of Age, The Case for Elderhood in a Time of Trouble. Uh, Stephen is also the creator and principal instructor of the Orphan Wisdom School. And this is kind of, you know, death and and grief is kind of Stephen's forte. And in our second conversation, I... Presented a couple scenarios to him and asked him, you know, how, as a father, as a parent, you know, what was the appropriate response in relationship to explaining death uh, to what was my three or four year old son at the time. And uh, so I'm going to play this clip. It's about nine minutes. And. Then I'll come back and share my thoughts. And uh, so, yeah, hopefully you take something from it and uh, talk to you after. He had passed away over the past four or five years. Uh, had several aunts and uncles and a grandmother pass away. And for my part in it, in the grieving process, I have to admit that 
I can't look you in the face and say that I've done it well or even done it at all. Um, and to go along with the death, um, about two years ago, I was in a store with my, at the time, three-year-old son. And it was a like a farm and feed store. And we came across like a cattle feed, and there was a mouse, a dead mouse in there. And he's like, look, Dad, that, that mouse is sleeping. And like with no hesitation, I was like, no, buddy, I think that mouse is dead. And I would, it astonished me from that point forward for the next probably like six months, like how much that stuck with him. And anything that prompted him to think about that, he would ask questions. And so I get this sense that, you know, I know I was doing the best that I could. My intentions were good. And I'm doing, really just doing the best I can with what I know. And so I tell you these two stories to, I guess, ask the question of, how do I or someone like me like reorient themselves to death? Or what does that process begin? How does that process begin? Well, I think your your stories help in answering the question. It's this the reorientation that you're asking about is not a feat of the imagination. You just don't engineer a kind of revamp of your basic ontology around life and death. You just don't. I don't know anybody that does it as a consequence of the will. So then what's plan B if there is such a thing? And the answer is you hope that life backs you into enough corners that there's no wiggle room, right? And you don't get a choice. Well, I suppose you could you could literally opt out of choosing, which is in its own choice, of course, but Generally speaking, life is extremely abundant in its opportunities to strip you of your old untested certainties or these kind of what I call obsidian certainties. You familiar with the nature of obsidian? No, I can't say that I am. Okay, it's people mistake it for a rock. It's actually a, gl a glass. It's volcanic glass. Okay. It's it's rock that got heated, you know, insanely hot, went liquid, and then its cooling process. It was not annealed in any way, so it's extremely, it can take an edge like nobody's business as a naturally occurring material. It's astounding stuff. Highly sought after for, uh, by the Flint Napping Brigade and, uh, and uh, so on. Okay. But um, it's hopelessly brittle, right? So it just shatters without much prompting really at all. And that's what most people's certainties are, especially, I would as a guess, in a time like the one we're in now, where there's nothing but certainties. And you know what they're masquerading, or what they're masking, excuse me. They're masking a depth of fundamental doubt that, that doesn't respect itself and tries to turn into something else that looks more user-friendly and more market-friendly and all the rest. So... The good thing about the two stories you're, you're telling me is it allows me to say to you, yeah, that's a good start. You know, a dead mouse in a feed bag. I mean, you know, not to play fast and loose with the mouse's life, but I would say in the, in the fullness of things, um, it's, a, it's a scale that a three-year-old can approach. Imagine that death is a, ultimately a deity. That's my understanding. And as a deity, it's, uh, it doesn't have much time for our deeply undignified um, imagining that we have opinion, you know, legitimate opinions about this kind of thing. We don't really. What we should be doing is learning about it, not establishing our position vis-a-vis -vis that. But see if you can just understand the basic uh, flight path of aging and diminishment and 
decrease and decline, all the industrial strength D words that end with death, uh, 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 as far as we know. But there's lots more, I'm quite sure, but I can't speak with any authority about it at all. So the other thing is to say that your son's combination of, of deep curiosity and awe, which it sounds like what, what he's expressing to you, is another starting point for you as much as for him. And the two of you, in some fashion, it's not a matter of you leading the way as the kind of superior intelligence on the matter. I, I think more. I think it, it would make more take the form of, imagine you're, you're cave exploring, you and your son. Mm -hmm. And of the two of you, because of his, let's call it more elaborated curiosity probably compared to yours at his age, He's the one with the light down there in the in the caves. Mm -hmm. So now he's got the light. Let's say it's on his little helmet there. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm doing this, mm -hmm. right? and you're behind him in the dark. Now you could lose track of him if you're not physically in touch with him. So you're holding on to his belt loop from behind, and this is how it goes basically. You saying to him, "Listen, I don't have a light. I can't see." But you got a light, but you but you don't know what you're looking at. So now, you tell me what shows up in that shaft of light. Just tell me what you see. And as he does so, you begin to assemble his his strange and disjointed account of what's in front of him. Right? Not so much, not quite interpret, but do a lot of justice to his his attempt to see something whole that he can't quite see the wholeness of. And as he moves forward or side to side, you follow him. It's not the other way around. You follow him and you're taking your cue from what falls into the into the beam of his curiosity and his attention span. And that's what you go with, you see. Okay. And I'm not I'm not saying this like he's a little Dalai Lama and you're following his guidance. That's not what I mean. Like, take it easy, right? It's, it's hard enough to be a three-year-old without mm -hmm. that kind of burden about being a genius and all that nonsense. Mm -hmm. But, <clears throat> as I said a minute ago, his capacity to be curious may not have found its legal limit at his age. And, I mean, wouldn't that be something if that were true? And I probably, I'm convinced that it's probably true. And, you know, it reflects rather sadly, doesn't it, on our capacity to be curious Mm -hmm. so we're so desperate to know stuff and to add to the pile of shit we're certain about that uh, curiosity is an early casualty and often a permanent one of our mania for for uh, being on top of things and being masterful and stuff. Finally, you know what you get to attest to with him. It's going to sound like a fridge magnet saying, right, or a T-shirt, and I suppose it, it would do well as a T-shirt. I'd like a piece of the action if it ever happens, but you could say this. The more you learn about mystery, the more mysterious those things become. Okay, the mystery doesn't dispel with your insight, your marvel, your awe. And you get to participate with a young child that you help bring into the world in a posture of, of, of a creature of the world instead of a stranger to the world. Mm -hmm. you're, you're a creature, he's a fellow creature, and you're regarding the creation that produced you. You know, something like the view behind you right now. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's an opportunity to be literally, when you think about what the word means, wonderful. And really, pretty good day. Okay, so I'm hoping that that clip gave you some insights, maybe gave you a framework in which to uh, handle discussions with your children uh, around death, you know, when they see the news or they deal with it 
in their immediate life uh, 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 gives you a framework in which to handle that conversation. It's not an easy conversation to have, and yet that is our responsibility. We as fathers, especially, uh, you know, obviously it falls to both parents, but I'm a father, and I'm mostly talking to fathers that it is on our shoulders to bridge these tough conversations, to have these tough conversations with our kids, uh, with our wife, with our family. Uh, it's our job to lead them through that, those scenarios and allow them to experience whatever it is that they are experiencing, uh, get down and connect to their level, like Stephen said, you know, attach yourself to them, you know, literally and figuratively, and just listen to what they are saying, hear what they are seeing and expressing, allow them to go through the process of grieving, whatever that may look like, and, you know, walk through that process together. Uh, and I think that that is a beautiful way to go through that process with our kids because it's very easy to give the answers like, oh, well, there's a bigger plan and, or it's God's plan or whatever number of answers you can provide somebody in the case of death and who knows you know maybe those are all true but it is the easier route to go when you're actually in the situation of grieving and dealing with death and having that conversation Because it's it's very easy to give the answer of, well, it's God's plan. And then kind of drop it from there. And even if that is your ultimate belief that there's God, there's a higher power that kind of knows what's going on up there. That doesn't excuse you from having the tough conversations and allowing your family to go through whatever their process is of dealing with the fact that the fact of mortality. So it's tough and, but it needs to be done. It's a part of life. It's, It could be a beautiful part of life if we're in right relationship to it. And so, yeah, it, uh, I'm just going to leave this right there. Those are some of my thoughts. Uh, hit me up on Instagram. Please like and share this. And let me know how it resonates with you and what your thoughts are. Would love to hear it. Uh, so until next time, uh, look forward to engaging more on socials. So look for us on Instagram, especially that's where I will be spending the majority of my time. Um, uh, So go on and have a great day and we'll talk next week.